So, Berto, imagine this. You're a therapist. You're not a therapist, but imagine you are a therapist, and you're listening to repeated stories from multiple clients about having been through extreme abuse. You can imagine that it might eventually make you traumatized yourself because you're listening, you're imagining all these horrible stories, you know, like the beginning of Saving Private Ryan. That, That's right. That movie uh, uh, traumatized me. Yeah. It, I didn't, didn't happen to me. Mm-hmm. But after the movie, I felt traumatized. I felt, I felt impacted. Right. So you can imagine that this would happen over and over and over again. Well, if, you, if you can imagine that, what do you think might happen to a therapist over time? Uh, you become a nighttime vigilante trying to avenge all these people's lives. Yeah. Well, short of that, so that's one option. What, what else might happen to somebody? Well, okay, so you might need therapy yourself uh, mm-hmm. to overcome some sort of the, the trauma you might be accumulating. You might need to see less of those types of patients for a bit. Mm. You might need to talk to your co- colleagues about ways that they cope. Well, along those lines, we brought a colleague on the podcast to talk about such a thing. It's Rebecca Bloom. She's a therapist. She's been on, she's an art therapist. She's been on the podcast before talking about art therapy. We, did, we had a great art therapy session. We did. I still remember it fondly. We did. And uh, she's coming on the podcast to talk about this very thing because she's going to give a continuing education class soon that she wants to have people come to. So, Rebecca, welcome to the podcast. Kirk, thanks for having me here. Yeah. Berto, it's good to see you. This is the podcast called Psychology in Seattle, and I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I am chair of the Couple and Family Therapy Program, and I am also a licensed therapist. My name is Humberto Castaneda. I brew hard apple cider flavored beer. Rebecca, welcome to the podcast. Tell us about this this course that you're going to give. Well, this has been an interest of mine since I started my counselor training. Uh, One of the benefits I was told that art therapy offered was a chance for art therapists to work on their counter-transference in a nonverbal way. At the time, I didn't understand how important that was going to be. But the longer I stayed in the field, the more burnout I saw. Uh, My first job was in the South Bronx in uh, a dual diagnosis unit. In in New York? In New York City. People were both chemically addicted and mentally ill. And some of my peers, my counseling peers, were doing some pretty messed up things that were like classics in the book (gasps) of what you shouldn't be doing. Like what? There was someone who was married to a former client. Whoa. Uh, There was a therapist who had one client go get her lunch every day. What? (laughs) There were people who never did their paperwork and, you know, did it all in a marathon session over a weekend. And I knew this because the place was open on the weekends. And so this person would come in twice a year. So you think that this behavior might have not occurred if these therapists had not been exposed to so much vicarious trauma. Is that what you're saying? Uh, I'm saying that that much trauma kind of wears at your values. And if you're not getting good supervision and being kind of checking in about what your experience is. And I think these these cases recently with those prisoners that escaped in New York and you hear the whole case about how the guard was really brought in. Um, if you don't have good supervision and a good chance to talk about what's happening inside, you can get pretty wrapped up. You know, I, I wonder if there's a parallel there between... Uh, that kind of situation and, for example, cops that work in very disenfranchised areas that might start also, you know, as you put it, uh, man, this is such a mess. And then over time, they're like, ah, who cares about procedure? Who cares about this? Yeah, I think that's really true that um, it's it's your role starts to kind of disintegrate. And um, vicarious traumatization is really talking about that psychic disintegration So you were providing a course or some kind of activity for therapists to create art as a way of processing some of the uh, difficult stories that they had heard from their clients. Is that what you're saying? Uh, That's what I'm going to be doing. That's what you're going to be doing. Oh, okay. I thought you said you had already done it. So that's the course you're going to do. That's the course I'm going to teach. Although I've had lots of opportunities to do it before this. So the first major one was when I worked at Asian Counseling and Referral Service, 
the staff there was so stressed out. Many of them had been in the same internment or refugee camps as the people that they were now counseling, or in general, that communities were so small that, you know, they didn't have very high levels of separation between their clients. And so everything was very inter- intertwined. What, what, what kind of camps? What, like where? Refugee camps. Like, like Cambodia, mm-hmm. Mon. Oh people. my gosh. So, but they were here in the U.S. Yes. They had emig- immigrated. Yes. And they were traumatized. The therapists have been traumatized because they went through the war trauma in their home country. They come here, they become therapists, and then they're treating clients that have also been through the war trauma. And so lots of trauma. Capital T. (laughs) Lots of trauma. The HR department, I uh, presented them with this idea to let me do an open studio for staff once a month. And I would set up different activities and people could begin to suggest activities and the staff would come together and laugh and smile and just let some of that stress out. Activities involving art. Yeah. Yeah. Like like describe one. Uh, we did a really fantastic group mural project. There was two different murals up and they stayed up forever and people came and got, when it was time to get like a, a unit photo, they wanted to take it in front of the staff mural. So it really became part of the environment what was the directive just express yourself or what uh that one would be two big pieces of paper i think one i pre-drew a dragon because i knew that was a powerful symbol in that community i think the other one became a road with a house uh but then people started asking for activities so we did candle making people wanted to do the martha stewart technique of hollowing out a lemon half (laughs) Making a candle. What? Yeah. I've never heard of this. <laughs> this is fantastic. So I got pushed to learn new things and it meant even more to them. And maybe a group of people would come in that wouldn't have come in for a, a, an activity that I thought was interesting. Um, so that's when I saw how powerful it was. So you're giving a continuing ed course. Yes. What's the capacity for this class? Unlimited? Uh, uh, unlimited. I think it's actually, it's either 24 or 50. Okay. And and how do they find out when and where and how to sign up? So Cascadia.org. Uh, many, do you know it? Yeah. It, that, are, they, are they a part of UW? They're actually not. Oh. They, they, uh, They're in Bothell? Are, they are in Shoreline. Shoreline. They, Cascadia. Okay. They meet at the Shoreline, uh, it's the school district main office but it has a series of large classrooms with okay. AV equipment and so this class will take place in Shoreline yes so go to Cascadia.org mm-hmm. and search for Rebecca Bloom or vicarious trauma okay it's happening on September 18th so I think it's right on the front page of okay. options September 18th 2015 in case you're listening to this 40 years from now <laughs> deep Which, in the future yeah so okay uh, I, sorry at, at first I thought you said um, earlier when we <laughs> were talking, I thought you said by curious trauma. <laughs> it's like, man, I guess that could be traumatizing. <laughs> we'll, we'll call that a, a Freudian listen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so they sign up for it. How much does it cost? Uh, it's 140. 140, which is typical price for yes. continuing it. And it's all day. It is from nine to four thirty. So and six hours, seven hours. Yeah, six hours. Six hours. So of- pretty typical price for continuing ed. And throughout the day, are, is there lectures, activities, all activities? What? Uh, there will be lectures uh, putting vicarious traumatization into a context across theories. So I'll spend a little bit of time in psychoanalytic theory, uh, talking about the difference between countertransference and vicarious trauma. Uh, Then we'll move into Jungian theory and look at the concept of the wounded healer. So just to pause you on that. So, you know, I could think of a lot of differences between vicarious trauma, secondary trauma, and countertransference. Now, the definition of countertransference is pretty vary depending on Mm -hmm. the writer and depending on the era of history. But, you know, countertransference broadly can can refer to the feelings and reactions that we as therapists have often related to our own inner conflicts in relation to client material but vicarious trauma is really like an ongoing thing that that transverses different clients and into your personal life and right. and it's a it's perhaps you know according to trauma theory and biology might actually start quote unquote rewiring the brain correct mhm 
So it's not just counter transfer. It's like, oh, I'm reacting to something the client's saying. It's it's a biological altering of your brain because of how much uh, trauma you visualized in your mind and experienced viscerally as the client talks about these traumas, right? Right. But historically, it was perceived that if you were having burnout or compassion fatigue towards your clients, it was because you hadn't gotten enough of your own psychotherapy and you hadn't done enough of your work. And so the concept now that it's not quite unavoidable, but it doesn't mean that you have somehow failed as a therapist. Right. Even though Freud was, you know, he didn't say this directly, it was implied that if you were experiencing countertransference as an experienced clinician, there was something sort of wrong with you. Uh, really? It was yeah. kind of judgmental about that? Yeah. I don't know if that just emerged out of the culture of psychoanalysis, but yeah, if, if you were having a reaction, then your colleagues or supervisor would say, you need to go back to analysis, son, and, uh, and, and quick, because you're having an emotional reaction to your clients. Whereas contemporary you know, therapists or trauma-oriented or trauma-aware therapists would not be judgmental about it at all and would really say it's a natural outgrowth of being exposed to those kinds of stories. Right. So I... Uh, have really been re-inspired by the work of Judith Herman and actually the earthquake that she brought forth in therapy by bringing in a feminist concept that rape happens, rape is not made up, rape is common, and people deserve to be honest about their experience. When she started doing that in the early 80s, that was, and she was doing it in medical settings. She was doing it as a, a PCP, a primary provider, and was looking in the research, where is this? And so as she began, as she wrote Trauma and Recovery, came out in 1992, um, she really changed the face of A, what clients were allowed to speak about in therapy, and B, how it was processed. Wait, 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 say that again. So yeah, are you saying there were, uh, were there legal limitations or just taboo topics or... There, it was, there was definitely taboo topics, and the idea of that incest or rape may have long-term psychological impacts on clients, and that trauma has consistent... So this is totally fascinating. I just learned this yesterday, that uh, the FBI just reclassified rape, that the definition of rape can count if the person who was attacked did not fight back. Yeah, I heard this on a podcast. Did you hear it on a podcast? I heard it on NPR. Yeah. Yeah. It, you're saying that it wasn't? Yeah. It, yeah. What? It, up until just a few years ago, which is basically today, wow. it was classified as something that was forcibly, and someone had to fight back. That's right? biblical, man. Right. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. Right, right. So in the general culture and in the culture of psychotherapy, up until very recently, and to some extent still today, the idea was that when you've been traumatized or when you've experienced a difficult thing, that with with really minimal effort, you could move on from it. Mm -hmm. That with, you know, if you have a cathartic moment, or you let it go, or you learn to forgive, or you just stop ruminating on it, that that everything will be okay. Buck up. Yeah, uh, essentially. And and it's a male perspective, given that men in general don't experience as much sexual assault. As, as women do. Men certainly experience sexual assault and have since the beginning of time, but uh, the dominant idea, you know, was, was coming from men who have been traumatized less in that way. And from their perspective, they're like, well, we'll just get over it. But uh, research started to actually find that you know, uh, not, they, they already knew from, you know, sort of reluctantly that soldiers coming back from the war would have these PTSD symptoms afterwards, this, you know, this trauma syndrome. And it didn't respond very well to normal psychotherapy of just telling them to let it go. And over time, they started realizing, wait, women, you know, feminist therapists started realizing, wait, some of these women who have been sexually abused have the same symptoms as some of these, as some of these soldiers who have come back from the war these long-lasting, decades-long lasting, decades -long lasting uh, symptoms. And it's taken up until today for it to become, for the most part, mainstream that rape can result in long-standing 
conditions related to trauma uh, biologically in the brain that don't respond very well to just telling someone to get over it. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. And so then counselors are put in this position where clients can tell very traumatic stories. Maybe they've been trained in a psychoanalytic model that hasn't given a lot of room. Or also what I saw when I was supervising students is that it used to be the perception that students would learn the craft of therapy by working with the worried well. And now students learn the craft of therapy by working with some of the lowest functioning folks out there. And so in my case consult class, I was doing a tremendous amount of work on addressing vicarious traumatization and most of the exercises that are we're going to do in this workshop uh, come from that experience. So one of my favorites is the metaphor, stay on the boat. <laughs> Stay on the boat. Stay on the boat. So, I, so I'm, gu- I'm guessing you bring a boat to class and you put it in a big thing of water and then you put people on and whoever is the last person on the boat wins, wins the exercise. Whoever doesn't drown to death. <laughs> right. Yeah. Whoever doesn't drown to death means that they're a good therapist. Very good. Yeah. Yay. Well, so the idea is young counselors early in their career want to help so much. And it is the role of the supervisor to say the best thing you can do for this client is to have distance. And um, s- yeah. the person has fallen off the boat. Yeah. Your desire is to jump into the water to rescue them, but they're sharks. Yeah. And you forgot your shark suit and you have a harpoon, but it's for whales, not shark. Long story short, stay on the boat. Well, are you trying to save people who have fallen off the boat by staying on the boat? Yes, you offer a better chance of saving that person. You can throw the, the rescue thingy, the right. circle with the- Life preserver. That, that yeah. stuff, yeah. yeah. And sometimes that might mean you can't immediately save someone. You have to be patient mm-hmm. and remain on the boat yourself and not fall into the shark-infested right. waters. And they yeah. might be annoying, so you might be actually like happy that they fell in the water. And, right. You know, or yeah. I guess not if you're a therapist, but yeah, totally. In more, in more cases than not. Yeah. Are you going to work in Sharknado into this? Because <laughs> I should have some graphics in my PowerPoint from yeah. Shark Week. Yeah. I think yeah. that's clearly. So I have a question. Yeah. If you are the example that seems very um, obvious is the one where I was also traumatized in the same way, or mm-hmm. I came from the same war-torn region, or something. But let's say you're not. Let's say you were a fairly balanced individual. Your parents are still together. Whatever. Just fairly balanced. And you started treating folks. I'm going to reword that. <laughs> a person who has not been traumatized. You can be balanced and traumatized. No, I mean, the, you know, the ones that walk on wire. Yeah. They're, they're really balanced. But I think what you're going for is someone who hasn't been hasn't traumatized. Hasn't been traumatized. Okay. Yes. And uh, they start their practice. And over the years, slowly but surely, without them realizing, this stuff starts getting to them. So mm-hmm. I guess my question is, How does someone, what are the signs? What are the symptoms? How would Mm -hmm. someone know, hey, maybe I am developing uh, a vicarious traumatization or something like that? That is an excellent question. So you're asking, what are the signs of burnout? Mm -hmm. So one of them is that you are repetitively think about your client's story. You can't shake it when you get home. Uh, Another one would be uh, somatic issues. Always Body issues. Yes. You always have a stomach ache. As you head into work or you see that client's name on the schedule, you suddenly feel really icky in your body. Uh, Another issue would be turning away from the things that you used to love to do. Wow. Maybe you stop hanging out with friends. Maybe you stop doing your hobbies. Maybe you feel guilty about your own joy in your life because other people are suffering so much. Um, There's so many... Yeah. In in addition to those, uh, in my experience, and according to the research that I've read, when you have difficulty empathizing or having Mm -hmm. compassion Mm -hmm. for your clients or really anybody, it's a sign of ongoing secondary trauma. So like when you're talking to your friends and they start talking about something that feels big to them and in your head, or maybe out loud, you say, (laughs) buck up. (laughs) Right. You, You, in your mind, you start rejecting it. 
you, yeah. because you've heard too much. Mm-hmm. You've ta- you've had they call it compassion fatigue, vicarious trauma, secondary. You you're tired of providing compassion. You've provided too much, mm-hmm. and the next person that needs it, you just don't have it to give. And when you don't have compassion, then you start having judgmental thoughts like get over it or what's wrong with this person or 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 you just don't really listen that well. You're just like uh huh yeah what what's next? And you could absolutely imagine a therapist getting to that point after hearing a lot of difficult stories. I I had a an experience with a friend who I was at the time listening to a lot of news about what was going on in Africa and I also in the Middle East about um, the kids, you know, in Uganda and all these things. And I remember this person came to me and was talking about something that was going on in their life, which granted by comparison was quote unquote minor, but was really affecting them. And I was so callous. Because I, I even said, I even was sarcastic. I was like, oh, yeah, no, no. I totally see how that's like, you know, being war-torn and torn from your family and having to w- wield a rifle at 12. And clearly this didn't go over well. But in my mind, I was perfectly justified because I'm like, how dare you first worlders care about your own little tiny problems when the world... Like-? But it's it's kind of that... I was, I was having fatigue, even though I'm not a therapist, because mm-hmm. I had been listening to so much of these horrible, tragic news that when this person that's just around me came to me with their problems i didn't want to hear it i couldn't handle it and i didn't realize that it it, it was later i was like hmm (laughs) that was lame yeah so what are the jungians and how do they overlap with vicarious trauma well they have a of course a very beautiful theory (laughs) as all things jungian um are so beautiful so it's the idea of the wounded healer it comes from the greek myth of chiron that uh, within every client. What's the Greek myth? Uh, Chiron was the first Minotaur, news to me, as featured in uh, the. Oh, the labyrinth in, in the Midas. The yes. King Midas uh, la- labyrinth? Yeah. With, yes. Uh, what's his name? Hercules. No, 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 not Hercules. Well, he, he went there too, but who was the guy who. Per- not Perseus. Uh, Odysseus? No. I, I Ulysses? Can't... No. Uh, Achilles? You spent too much time in Greece recently. (laughs) It was Perseus. Perseus, maybe, yeah. He has to go through the maze, and there's the Minotaur. Yes. Yeah. Wait, how do you spell his name? I want to look it up. S, no, sorry. C-H-I-R-O-N. Which Which I think is Chiron, right? Chiron. Chiron, I should know. Chiron? I think it's Chiron. He's in the Lightning Thief movies. Chiron. 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 Uh, let's see, was held to be a superlative centaur among brethren, uh, mythology, da, 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 uh, Oh, a centaur, I see, okay. So, of Achilles. half man. Half horse, half man. So, yes. this wasn't the minotaur, this no. was the centaur. Half, that's half okay. bull, half man. Yeah. Do you mean Prometheus? <sighs> no. Uh, this is a long page, I'm not going to read it's it. It's okay. He, so, he taught a lot of people. He taught yes. Achilles. Yes. He taught Hercules. But, but we Jason. were way off with the Midas. Sorry. <laughs> he taught uh, Perseus and Theseus. He taught a lot of the Greek heroes. Yes. Was so what joke? he had to teach them was that when he, w- he'd never been wounded because he was such a great warrior. But when he got wounded, he went into the cave and healed himself and then found his brilliance there. So the idea, ah. yes. Healer, heal thyself. That kind exactly. Of- Healer, heal thyself comes from him. Ah. So the Jungians have this idea that within every therapist is a wounded client. And within every wounded client is a healer. Uh, and so within Jungian theory, there is so much room <laughs> For so many things. So the way they look at the wounded healer is that there is reconciliation in the opposites. You can be both wounded and healing. Um, You can have both personal suffering and the capacity to endure these ideas that these the shadow and the light can exist Mm. together. That's very nice. (laughs) So... So they they take kind of a poetic approach to it. Yes. Yeah. And if you watch on YouTube any videos on vicarious traumatization from the Jungian perspective, there's a lot of quiet talking <laughs> <laughs> by very beautiful but calm people. So Jungians acknowledge that therapists both have a healer and a wounded healer at all times, mm-hmm. I see. And a patient inside of them. Right. And rather than by being in denial or being 
sort of one-sided and saying, I'm a healer. I can't be wounded. Jungians from an early time, acknowledge, and Jung, Jung himself, acknowledge that uh, all healers are wounded. Yes. That, and that's okay. It's normal. So what are, do you have other theories that you go into? Yeah. Uh, so I have a, just a blast with feminist theory that we talked about Judith Herman and her amazing work. I always have a blast with feminist theory, too. <laughs> it's so loud. It's very loud and it, fun. Yeah, <laughs> and there's so much room. And then I go into narrative therapy, uh, the work of, I'm going to butcher her name, Karen... S- Minotaur. S- Sock- it's, it's Chiron. <laughs> S-A-A-K-V-I-T-N-E. Okay. And she came up with, also in the 90s, uh, a nine-question questionnaire for therapists to review how they're traumatized by their clients. Uh, I found this questionnaire in the book by uh, Ricky Greenwald, uh, Trauma Treatment for Children. And I was so impressed with this nine questionnaire that I gave it to all my third quarter case consult students and said, instead of writing me the standard reflection paper, address these nine questions. It should be pointed out that you used to teach with me at Antioch Uh University, Seattle, and you were in the art therapy program and you taught case consultation to the art therapy students. And Rebecca and I were the two young people at the age of 42 or however old. Oh, you, you weren't young again. You were young. We were young. We were very, we were very youthful. We were the two youthful therap- or, uh, professors in the university at the age of 40. You'd be surprised now, though. Rebecca has left. There are people younger than us now that work there. Shocking. Yeah. Well, what are those questions? Let, let, let me guess. It's like, what's the average speed of an African swallow? <laughs> How do you thing. spell Chiron? <laughs> that that should be a question. I don't want to give them all away. Sure. Uh, so I'll just start with the first one. Cool. So it would be how has been how has working with traumatized clients impacted your beliefs about the world? Can I answer that? Yes, please do. When I first started out, I was pretty innocent to the evils of mankind. I mean, I'd certainly seen movies and heard stories, but to hear them up front and personal with someone that I really cared about over and over and over again changed my perception of human beings kind of in general and of the system in general. Like our legal system Mm. didn't always work the way that I had thought it should work. And so uh, it, it, it changed how I saw abusers. It sort of raised my awareness of that being out there. I think it also changed how I saw resilience. I think I saw resilience in people that I thought would be impossible given the amount of abuse they had gone through. Uh, Those are just some off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say my first internship was at... uh the Foundling in New York, which is the oldest foster care agency in the country. And I worked on a unit. I was the art therapist intern for a unit of kids that had been kicked out of multiple foster care placements in New York City. And were on this unit to try and figure out what they were going on, what was going on. And some of them were the cutest, sweetest, kindest kids. And that blew my mind. Like, what is going on here? You, you expected more like mis- misadjustment, like they're kind of criminal behaviors, that kind of thing? Yeah. 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 Um, and so I remember just kind of looking at everybody a little bit differently and thinking about the system a little bit differently. Like, are they not training these providers how to work with these kids or what is happening? But it really... I saw how broken the system was, and that's actually something that I'll talk about. That's one of the things that psychoanalyst, psychoanalytic theory really offers to this, is they really talk about how the brokenness of the system impacts the clinician as much as the brokenness of the client. That within the broken system, that's where the powerlessness can really be at its height. Can you give a little bit of context to the brokenness of the system? So they have this fascinating theory that the lowest functioning clients at an agency filter up 
through management and management begins to behave like the lowest functioning clients at the agency. Yeah, I would say whether that's true or not, it definitely fits uh, the bill in my experience. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and so then it gives the clinicians permission to approach their bosses with the skills that they would use to approach low functioning clients. <laughs> that's the uh, the Peter principle, but like, you know, did you ever read that book? The, the one where like the incompetence rises to its level. Mm. And so, um, so if I'm understanding right, this is like in a lot of these organizations, there is dysfunction at the management level and it feels like the dysfunction they deal with, with their clients. Great. Wow. Yeah. I've certainly seen this in agencies and in organizations like CPS, like Child mm -hmm. Protective Services, DSHS, which is Department of Social Health Services in Washington State. I've certain, I mean, I certainly have a lot of respect for the individuals that work in, in these organizations. However, when you talk to them, they'll, they'll talk about some, some very interesting behaviors that start developing in people. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, it's always been my guess that it's such a stressful environment that eventually you just start fighting with each other or your brain doesn't work quite as right anymore or you have this compassion fatigue or it, that you, you're just sort of done being functional or something. <laughs> So a very famous example is that, so a client with a borderline diagnosis could be at an agency and, and the staff could start fighting in staff meeting. This client is working all of us. No, you don't understand how broken this client is. And so the clinicians literally take on the client's diagnosis. Yeah. In family systems theory, they, ca they call it isomorphism. Mm -hmm. And I've certainly seen it when I'm in case consultation at agencies or at, at university or wherever, and we're talking about a difficult client, particularly if the clinician isn't very experienced or doesn't have a differentiated stance with the client, you know, they're pretty reactive themselves or they feel really incompetent or something. That anxiety just fills the room and everyone starts acting anxiously and it, from a place of insecurity or a place of desperation, a place of criticalness or a place of, we must fix this problem. And, and the, what Bowen would say to do is just take a deep breath and remember that everything's okay <laughs> and try to be the differentiated lint, you know, a foundation for, for the room. Have you seen this at your job with the beer and the fermented juices? Oh my gosh, absolutely. And another thing that comes to mind is um, uh, one of my relatives is a psychiatrist and he works with the very disturbed you know, people, uh, psychopaths, killers, those kind of things. Um, at a hospital. At a hospital, yeah. And he's actually trying to introduce music as therapy with some of these very, very unreactive, unresponsive individuals. And there's a lot of resistance apparently in the organization. And it's interesting because the, the, the way he describes it is like, they say things like, like, no, 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 no. We need to stick to the, to, to the drugs, to the things. And it's almost like these scared reaction. Like you would imagine a patient be like, no, 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 no. I must stick to my medicated doses. And, like, and so I, I can kind of see that kind of like the same type of behaviors at the management layer. <laughs> right. Because like, if you were at an organization organization where everyone was relatively healthy mm -hmm. and you could pat yourself on the back every night and say everything's hunky dory and then someone introduced the idea of why don't we mix it up and let's also do music you could imagine that there'd be more flexibility yeah oh why not let's try it right uh, i was also going to comment that at a previous job i started taking so as you were describing some of the things the the symptoms that when i asked you about the symptoms i was like oh my gosh i was having symptoms like that and of course it wasn't a therapy type job but i was having to deal with management and with some peers that that gave that stress it was it was like i was having to deal with patients with with psychopathy or, or other bad things and um and i started developing some of those symptoms of like i don't like what i used to like i every time that name comes up in an email or something i have a fear response i have a, a gag response you know like these kind of things so i think it can happen in professional settings uh and of course it can happen therefore in the therapy settings probably even more so but people don't tend to think of like of those parts of the therapist's world, you know, just like with cops, everyone is so unempathetic. And I'm not saying that they're 
what's happening right now in the country is, of course, very bad and, and regulations need to be put in place, better training. But what I'm trying to say is that as a society, we're also very unempathetic about firefighters and, 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 and soldiers and cops and people that are in high stress situations. We just expect that they do what they do. And, uh, oh, the war's over. Well, they should cope with the results. You right. Know? And, and that directly applies to what we're talking about here in that we expect therapists yeah. to also be completely impervious mm-hmm. to the traumatic stories and traumatic imagery that clients will bring to us. Yeah. And this this research around vicarious trauma, secondary trauma, burnout, compassion fatigue is actually kind of um, shall I say, it hasn't really been integrated into the profession yet. Yes. So speaking of that, I was desperately looking for simple statistics of what percentage of clinicians experience vicarious traumatization. There's very few studies done. Uh, One of the most interesting ones was done in Australia in 95. And they studied people specifically working with male sex offenders. And they found that 30%... 99%? (laughs) Well, it was interesting. 30% of the clinicians at any one time would meet the definition of vicarious traumatization. Wow. They found it was usually... Does that have to include significant PTSD symptoms or... You know, I'm assuming in this study it was... They would meet the the exact definition of secondary trauma. So having their own version of flashbacks of the client's experience and, yeah. s- and so on. So it's akin to the severity of PTSD. Right. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, so, and they found it most severe in uh, clinicians under the two-year mark or more common in clients in clinicians who'd been working less than two years and the clinicians who'd been there the longest, which is... Really interesting. Oh, wait, wait. You're just saying it was most common in the new ones and the, and the old ones, yeah. the vets. Yes. I see. Well, that makes sense, actually. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, yeah, because at the beginning, you don't have the defenses to defend yourself against yeah. this mm-hmm. stuff. In the middle world. zone, you have defenses, but you haven't been exposed to too much of it yet. But in later stage, therapists have, you know, don't, regardless of defenses, they've just been exposed to too They wear much. down, yeah. Yeah. And then the, I was trying to imagine, and because I have been in this, how it impacts a work environment when 30% of the people have post-traumatic stress symptoms. Right, because when you're when you're triggered and when you're at work, I'm guessing they would get triggered all the time. You're going to dissociate. You're going to be a little out of it. You might actually get angry. You might get aggressive. You're going to have a hard time listening. You're going to have a hard time thinking, being organized, listen, you know, understanding other people's needs in the office. <laughs> and and I'm just guessing that it would be a yeah a difficult environment. Downward spiral for the community. And I think if you asked any clinician. Do you think you've ever been in a staff meeting where 30% of your peers had active PTSD symptoms? I think most clinicians would say yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And this applies, as you were saying, to firefighters, police officers, school teachers, uh, school teachers, uh, first responder kind of people, right? right. Uh, doctors. I we had a, an episode with Nicole a while back in which she talked about all. She's a, a she works at the University of Washington. She's a medical professional, and she works a lot with prenatal issues. Mm. And she is there when when fetuses die, mm. and when babies die, and when people die. And she is expected to be very caring to the patients and the patient's family. And then she's expected to move on to the next patient <laughs> as if nothing had happened. Right. When she's just as traumatized as, as the patients are. And incidentally, sometimes she treats her friends and family, mm. you know, because when you have a doctor or a medical professional in your family, you go to them. Right. Because you, and if they go through it, something horrible, uh, then you're going through it with them. And again, in the, in the profession, it's, it's seen as you're being a wimp mm-hmm. if you take the rest of the day off or something. Right. It's terrible. Well, and this also speaks to uh, feminist theory that the pioneers of the study of bio curious traumatization, the actual coiners of the term to bring it into the professional environment were nurses, a female dominated field. So doctors could not admit that they were impacted by the work, but nurses, there's a tremendous amount of publications 
on vicarious traumatization in the nursing field. Yeah, there's a lot of relevant research and cutting edge, re- cutting edge re- research in fields that psychotherapists tend to ignore in the nursing field. So mm-hmm. the nur- nurses will publish uh, articles that are very relevant to us as psychotherapists wow. that are, are that you know, psychotherapists, sh- you know, shamefully ignore a lot of times, like mm-hmm. vicarious trauma. It's just absurd that a nurse would have to come up with a psychological research topic right. when therapists, you know, this is our area. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like us coming up with a way to change bed uh, bedpans uh, or something. A heart rate monitor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking also that um, there's these population sets that obviously must experience vicarious trauma uh, on a mass scale, uh, I, I can remember when I was in, in Colombia in the 80s, and essentially every night there were the news was like this massive, depressing threat about all these murders and all these bad things that happened just around the corner and stuff. And this was the whole population, and a population that honestly probably wasn't going to therapy, had the money to go to therapy. And so I could only imagine the 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 you know how it builds on top of itself. Then the neighbors start being less neighborly because they're traumatized, and that leads to more trauma. And ah, uh, and then you can imagine even more war torn regions. And yeah, oh my goodness. Yeah, I I have a I've I won't say specifically because I don't have the research in front of me, and it would be potentially a generalization. But I've seen clients from particular regions of the world that all seem to exhibit what you're talking about Mm -hmm. that they've had a you know some some instances you know decades centuries of of war and rape and terribleness and as a result literally everyone has some form of trauma syndrome whether it's ptsd or neglect because their parents were too uh, desperate to actually pay attention to their children, and it just gets passed down through the generations. And then you have addiction problems, and and basically, you know, the entire community suffers from some psychological issue as a result. And then they come to the states, come to Seattle, and then and then I see a lot of those people from those from those regions of the right. world. One of the people were asking me, would this training, the idea of intergenerational train, intergenerational trauma which is what you're speaking about, would, would it apply to this training? And all the examples I'm going to do, uh, I've done with clients addressing intergenerational trauma as well, because it is the same experience in a way of just the stories being transmitted uh, that cause the nervous system to literally flood. Right. So did our responses to that first question indicate anything about our vicarious trauma level. So the beauty of narrative therapy is it just gives you time and space to tell your story. What's what's another question? <laughs> um, let's see. I like this question a lot because it, it it really gets people thinking. How did how has working with traumatized clients impacted your sense of control? Impacted your sense of control. How do you interpret that? Am I supposed to interpret that broadly? Yeah. My sense of control, like over my life? Yeah. I would say it has impacted my sense that I have less control Mm -hmm. over my life since I've seen what can happen to people who do, who lead good lives Mm -hmm. and yet get traumatized Mm -hmm. unfairly. Mm -hmm. And how it's seemingly kind of random who ends up being at the bad end of a stick. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. The wrong end of a stick? What's the what's that saying? What's the good end of a the stick? The sharp, fun end of a hot poker. poker. Stick. The blunt yeah. end. Well, to that to that point, um okay, so I just this last weekend I had this near physical fight, which I haven't had since I was in high school. Do tell. I was uh in a storage unit and I was uh going through stuff to donate and things like this. I was sitting there just going through my stuff, uh, and I was with a friend and we were talking out loud thinking through oh should i keep this book oh you know i bet i know who wants this and stuff like that and i have a loud voice so i was probably being loud that's fine um a ways down the hallway there was a, a young man also in his storage unit i went upstairs to use the bathroom when i came downstairs he said something to me i couldn't quite make it out and i turned around and when i first looked it looked like someone i knew 
And so, and what it, what he said sounded like, "Hey, can you guys keep it down?" So I actually thought it was like someone I knew, kind of being, "Hey, hey, keep it down, you two, you know, that kind of thing." So I started walking towards him and kind of like smiling, and being like, "What?" And then I realized it wasn't someone I knew. And he said, "I said you guys need to keep it down because you're being very loud and you're sharing personal details." And I, I was like so caught off guard. I'm like. What? I could understand the loud part, maybe, maybe. Although it was so far away and people were banging upstairs. It was a storage unit. But the personal details part, I was like, which books I'm going to keep? Like, so, so I was like, oh, you're being serious. And then the guy squared up and he seemed to be military because it said something like National Guard or, or Army Reserves. I can't quite remember. But he looked probably military in his 20s, uh, fit and probably military. And he squares up and he does uh, a sign with his hands going, yeah, and you know what, this is my space, so you need to back off. So I was like, what are you doing? Like, I started walking back to my area and I said, like, look, we'll try to keep it down, that's weird. I said, but that's weird. And you know, I shouldn't have said that because that obviously doesn't help de-escalate. But then he says, what did you say? <laughs> and then I turn around and said, I said that that's weird. He said, oh, well now you can come back into my personal space and we'll settle this. And Meaning like, you I always love fight. that. I always love that. How aggressive, you know, douches will always do that where it's like, clearly you're, you're, you're separating and you're moving on and, and they've, they've got to, they, it's like they need to stay engaged he, or something. He wanted the fight. Yeah. It's like, it's like there always has to be some last word or something. And it's, and, so, and yeah, it's, it's exactly. always just like, just, you know, just let it go. <laughs> There's like several points where you, the person in your position has to turn around. Do you yep. know what I mean? You have to turn around yep. and then you say anything, he's going to take an issue with it. And then you've got to continue kind of, okay, he's just... <laughs> He's worked well, out. And I even said, I said at that point, I didn't say any more weird things. So that was very weird to me. But I said, um, like, wh- why are you doing this? Like, wh- what are you doing? Yeah. Like, I actually asked him. Well, what what you could have done was just point at him and say, PTSD. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but that's what you're getting at, right? Is yeah. He's in the military. Probably. And it seemed like he was going through something. Yeah. And I, and I was thinking about how those places are probably stressful places because you're normally at a storage unit because you have an overflow of stuff for some reason that's not awesome. Yeah. Normally, not always, but normally. And, and then, he, but here's the, the thing that happened to me right after that is the, the employee that works there came downstairs and she started to complain to me like I was the, the one doing something wrong. <laughs> and that triggered me, that triggered a fairness response in me. Yeah. And the fairness response to me of me is because I think of my, like my growing up traumatized in a society where everything seemed unfair yeah. and in a family situation where things seemed unfair. So, so then like with the retrospect, I was like, oh my gosh, like um, that, that employee, oh, I'm so angry at her and stuff like that. And then someone pointed out, well, you know, she probably deals with tr- stressful situations like these a lot and she's probably traumatized herself. Yeah, <laughs> I, I totally agree. Were you bringing this up partially to point out that the guy might have had PTSD? The guy might have had PTSD. PTSD. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not going to call it PTSD, but clearly the gal probably deals with stressful situations. Yeah. It's something triggered me at when she was making me into the bad guy. Yeah. The, like, <laughs> the trauma trigger model of seeing the world, that lens, is very helpful a lot of the time. I use it a lot with my couple clients. Mm-hmm that particularly who have been traumatized by something in the past and i say and we'll have a whole language around like so did anyone get triggered this week you know and but <laughs> but but we but we talk about that for several weeks so that everyone understands trauma and that it's understandable and natural and that when you get triggered your trauma gets engaged and your brain switches to a different mode and you're not going to be able to think straight and you're going to come out either swinging or retreating or dissociating or something and that full awareness and then i ask so were you triggered this week and they'll say yeah so and blah, blah, blah. And, and it's a very effective and I think accurate way of understanding how these things work. So when you approached him, that there's a chance that he misunderstood that, you know what I mean? Because yeah. he, he, he was, he wasn't someone you knew and you were, yep. you just, you turned around and like started walking right at him. <laughs> yeah. And with a, like a smile. And, and I, I thought also about a couple things. It's just hypotheses, but you know, I'm dark. I have a thick beard. If he was in the war, he was probably in a part of the world where that was not his friend. Yeah. And he had a turban on Yeah, for and some I, weird reason. And if I was being loud, which I probably was, right? Maybe noise triggers him, you know, like yeah. there's so, any sure. number of, explanation well yeah. and also in that trauma response we now know that the executive functioning goes completely offline and if you can think about this workshop for clinicians as a chance to 
re-engage that executive functioning in a safe way and let the their own experience out in a variety of ways. Right. Can, it, so, can it be at a QFC though or just safe ways? Just oh. so um, <laughs> you lecture organic? you <laughs> lecture about various things mm-hmm. and you also do activities that are experiential, which yes. is very Antiochian as we call yes. it, in which you walk the students through different art directives that help them to get to know their vicarious trauma and maybe process it. Yeah, I would say these are all going to be narrative therapy. I'm not expecting any art, but there will be time to respond. If you want to draw, that's great. If you want to write, that's great. If you want to talk quietly into your recording device for later, that's great. Um, But I really have seen in my work that getting a response out shifts people's experience so much. So I can do this nine questionnaire session as a, as a single session and people will come back the next week and say, boy, do I feel different. Huh. And so you're going to walk them through that mm-hmm. and they'll write down or share with their neighbors or talk with you or what? I think they'll write down. I think we'll have some dyad sharing and then some group sharing at the end. Great. And it, uh, go ahead. It is one of the questions you getting in their face and like slapping them really hard and being like, are you just going to stand there and do and do something or just sit there and bleed? I, I screwed up the quote. But but anyways, is it like that? Is it like Tombstone? No. Oh, man. Not I another know. random <laughs> unknown movie quote. Tombstone, you know Tombstone. Yeah, I've seen it, but I haven't memorized it. I, obviously, I haven't either because I screwed up the quote. <laughs> Gee, many crickets. It's one of my favorites. I will also say that I have found a hour-long interview with Judith Herman from 2000, uh, which I'm still deciding which clip to show during the training because it's all so amazing. Hmm. Life, who, who is that? Judith Herman wrote Trauma and Recovery. She's oh, that's a medical the one doctor. Okay. And she changed the face of trauma treatment. So again, you can go to cascadia.org and you can Google either vicarious trauma or Rebecca Bloom. You can also go to my website, uh, bloomcounseling.com. There's a link from my trainings tab. Okay. That's Bloom as in the bloom is off the rose. I, I hope it's still on the rose. <laughs> B-L-O-O-M. That's right. right. Uh, or bloomers. You know, like yes. women used to wear bloomers. Some wi- I, What's I, a bloomer? Bloomers are big undies. Big, I'm a big, big undies. fan. I hear they're coming back. They're what? coming back. The thong is out. Long live <laughs> The bloomers. Well, I would say that's the very opposite end. If you had thong on one end of the spectrum, bloomers are on the other end of the spectrum. Oh, are those those like like those fluffy, baggy, fluffy? fluffy. Oh no, yeah. no bloomers. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if they're bloomers, can you have just one bloomer? Like if you had one leg, <laughs> a bloom. I don't know. Yeah. Um, okay, and also you are in private practice downtown that's, Seattle. That's true. In the Pioneer Building with a lot of other therapists. Amazing that, therapists. That we know. Uh, Is that where we did the... That's where we did the sand tr- play sand therapy. Play. And we also did the dance movement therapy episode there. Hmm. Was that one there too? Yeah. Whoa. It's near the... Um, Totem pole? Yeah, it's where the underground tour leaves from the bottom floor. That's yeah. the most common question I get asked outside my building. Where's the underground tour? Where, in fact, in a whole block radius. You can stop me at any point within two blocks of my office and I can give directions mm. and hand signs often. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. And there used to be a second hand store in the lower level, but yes. it, it has since gone away. The in kind. fact, that, that, that blue cat that's over Ooh. there, uh, the porcelain freaky little blue cat that I have mm. in my office is from that store. Is that the kind where they sell raspberry berets? She wore a raspberry if, beret. If the current best clothing vintage store, I want to give a shout out to my favorite people down in Pioneer Square, is Bon Voyage Vintage, Ooh. where you probably could find a raspberry beret for that's awesome under twenty dollars. Well, it's Bon Voyage, you know, everyone that's oh. German, and we all know that <laughs> berets are, are German, so uh, Germo Italio. Yeah, wow. All right. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Rebecca. I thought always. this was very interesting. Always a pleasure. Yeah, it's always great to have. Thank you so much. It's always great to have a non-lay person come onto the podcast. Hey, maybe we can do another art therapy sometime. Oh, maybe we could. Yeah. 
Yeah. Go deeper, go darker. Go deep. Yeah. <laughs> Art therapy, colon, deeper, darker. darker. <laughs> so I'm working on my next book. So maybe with that one. That's yeah. right. So you can also buy Rebecca Bloom's book on Amazon, which is selling like hotcakes. And it is called the Art Therapy Workbook. Correct? Yes. Square the circle. Square the circle. And we had an episode about that as we well. We did. That's right. Yeah. So, so wait a minute. Are hotcakes like a thing that people buy a lot? Is that the deal? Well, they sell very fast. Flapjacks, flappy, flappy. Here, another one, another one. They yeah. are okay. the item that restaurants make the most profit on. Really? really? Oh, because it's, it's so cheap. They uh, just pour a little batter and there you go. Interesting. Wow. All right. Well, that does it for another episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining us. And please take care of yourself. Woo-hoo!